And you're listening to Flashpoints on Pacifica Radio. My name is Dennis Bernstein. This is your daily investigative news magazine. And we turn our attention back to the battle to protect, really it comes down to protect your legal right to vote which is being undermined in about a dozen different ways. That's just, that's just sort of off the cuff, but it's probably more than that. Uh, and we got a couple of people now who are legally engaged in trying to hold the state accountable to protect our vote. Let me tell you who's joining us. We've got Bill Simpich uh, in the studio. He's an attorney uh, based in San Francisco. Uh, he is working on a suit which was filed yesterday? Uh, Monday uh, in San Diego, Tuesday in San Bernardino, an election contest. An election contest. And also joining us uh, on the telephone is Bob Vitrakis. Uh He is joining us from Columbus, Ohio, where they know a lot about uh, elections getting stolen. Uh, Bob is an attorney. He's an author, he's a professor, he works with our friend Harvey Wasserman and Bob Fatrakis. Welcome to Flashpoints. Not here quite yet from what I hear. Okay, well we'll, we'll, we'll bring you in in one moment, Bill. Uh, let's start with you and later on we're going to be joined by Lori Grace who is a, uh, well she calls herself an election integrity activist I'm going to hear what that means as well. Uh, Bill, what, uh, explain us uh, what the suit is, what does it mean uh, election contest? Very interesting, instead of a recount you have a contest when a citizen challenges the final vote and that's what's happening, uh, you have to do it county by county in California, but if you can show that enough counties have enough votes, you know, we could still see this election flip to Bernie Sanders, or at least come a lot closer than it was. Uh, maybe get in more delegates, even though uh, it's titular. It's important to know exactly how many people voted for the man. And we think we've got great evidence from white out on the ballots to a shredder truck at the registrar's office to you name it. All right. Well, let's. Those are two very provocative uh, examples. Tell us about that. Oh, you said uh, you said white out, white out, white out. And if you can believe this, who's whiting out the registrar? And he said, if you can believe this, he said he's doing it to help show the intent of the voter. If you can believe that, he's saying that because people sometimes vote for people they shouldn't be voting for, which is determined by, you know, uh, sometimes by statute, sometimes by the registrar, uh, they have the right to white out the votes that they think is incorrect. And so they white out what they think is the incorrect vote. Why don't you save it so the rest of us can double check? Now I'm thinking to the Brexit vote and they counted the ballots and when there was a contested ballot there was a public discussion of the contest. Right, this is all done behind uh, doors w with glass uh, to keep the observers away. In almost every county in the state, the observers could not see what was going on. They had to use telephoto lenses in a couple cases. In most cases, they got nothing. They don't know what happened. There's no way to uh, make sure we know what the ballots contained or the custody. It's In Austria, they threw the vote out last week for this kind of thing. They said, we, there's irregularities, we don't know if there was cheating, but the, the observers not being able to observe was enough. I don't think that's going to cut it in America. They want a thousand times more proof. And the shredder? The shredder. Another great story. Uh, the, he, uh, the registrar had a shredder in front of his office at one of our press conferences. The shredder was bigger than God. Uh, it was absolutely enormous, uh, and based in Orange County, drove away as soon as we started taking pictures of it. A uh, guy jumps in the truck and drives off, and we are, we've are we sent him a letter saying, hold everything, we want to see all the records, and the registrar is now saying, oh, we were just shredding paper. They're not supposed to shred ballots or envelopes for 22 months, and we think at least the envelopes went No, they down. left off the last word off this. We were just shredding paper ballots. Also joining us, I think we have Bob Fertrakis on the line from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Bob Fertrakis, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. I'm glad we've got you. Let me remind people again. Uh, Bob is an attorney. He's an author. He's a professor. And he knows a great deal uh, about uh, the disappearing vote. Uh, they know a lot about that in Ohio. Bob, you filed suit, I guess, on Monday. Could you explain uh, what's at the core of your suit? Yeah, at, at the core of my suit is really uh, a very strange monopoly uh, where you know, it, 
the Edison Research Group uh, working for a media consortium, which the four broadcast networks, uh, CNN, and one uh, newspaper, the AP, essentially has a monopoly uh, over uh, these exit polls. Now, the exit polls are used universally, including by our own State Department uh, and the Agency on International Development, aid as the best way to indicate fraud in an election. Uh, and uh, what has happened in the United States is people have been told that the universal laws of statistics, you know, work everywhere on Earth, but in the United States, the exit polls can't predict election. Even though when I was watching in Ohio, CNN called the election without a single okay. vote cast in the state. I mean, I called up the Cuyahoga County Board of Elections in Cleveland and said, they've just called the election. Uh, uh, are you, how many votes have you reported? They said none. They'll uh, start coming out in 45 minutes. So we're filing, we're asking, uh, because of the collaboration between the secretaries of state uh, who give these special privileges under freedom of speech uh, for these pollsters to be closer than 100 feet uh, and also uh, to allow them uh, to have access uh, to the central tabulators and the state central tabulators. Uh, we're asking that they reveal uh, their unadjusted data uh, because if this was, if 12 states that were significantly outside the margin of error that had highly improbable results. If they were other countries, our State Department would not sanction their elections. So we're saying, uh, let's get a look at uh, your technique here uh, and uh, what your collaboration looks like with the Secretary of State's office, which keeps calling elections uh, that would not be validated yeah, yeah. anywhere else on Earth. You're listening to Fast Flashpoints on Pacific Radio. We're speaking with Bob Fertrakis. And, Bob, I know you've got a book uh, coming out or just came out with Harvey Wasserman uh, all about this. What's the book called? I'm sorry, I don't have the information in front of me. Well, it's called The uh, Strip and Flip Selection of 2016. And now it looks more like a how-to manual. Uh, you know, I, I spent some time in New York right after the, uh, uh, you know, uh, corruption in the elections there and i was out in california uh prior to the election and uh, in both cases initially they thought some stuff might happen but they were used to fairly uh you know uh fairly and decently run elections but uh, uh california and new york uh, can't be described as elections i mean they were coup d'etats those are the type of tactics uh the cia has historically used uh, to elect uh, governments friendly to the United States. I mean, uh, I think California may be the largest single disenfranchisement of voters uh, in the history of the United States. I would only add, Bob, that... This uh, is uh, Bill Simpich. Thank you, Dennis. I would only add that I think the problems in California have gone on for 200 years, going back, like many parts of the country, and as you have said, to the Native Americans, to the African Americans. The difference this time is because the no-party preference voters never had a champion. These things weren't quite as noticeable for Anglo people mm -hmm. until this time, with the Bernie Sanders campaign getting the full impact. Now, yeah. uh, go on, go on, Bob. No, our, our book kind of looks at a long uh, historical, you know, five Jim Crows and uh, argues that uh, uh, in this last Jim Crow, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, electronic and a lot of tactics that were used against indigenous and black people in the U.S. that used to be blatant and were used abroad, uh, you know, to subvert uh, governments are now being used in the United States. And the unique thing this time is, uh, you know, instead of the Republican uh, stealing votes from Democrats uh, electronically, it looks like, uh, you know, somebody was stealing votes on behalf of Hillary Clinton against the Sanders forces. And, and Bill, talk a little bit more about uh, your suit, who you're representing, how it came 
to pass. Well, it's interesting because Bob knows the history of Michael Vu, the Cuyahoga Registrar of Voters, who couldn't, uh, who in 2002 and 2004 in the Kerry election and 2006 all engaged in irregularities, uh, in, including the manual tally that's the subject of a lot of the lawsuits down south right now, where they're trying to justify the paper ballot vote vis a vis the machine vote, and uh, registrars don't want to do it because they don't want a verifiable tool that works. And Vu got caught with his hands in the cookie jar, so to speak. His underlings were ordered to go to prison. Uh, and uh, although they beat it on appeal, they were still ultimately convicted and protected by the Republican Party, even though Vu was a Democrat and these women were part of that administration. Weeks after his firing, he came to San Diego County. And he's been doing uh, similar problems have popped up since then. So this is about the fifth go-around of irregularities with M Michael Vu. And where does your suit go now? What happens? Well, what we got to do now is we've got to try to count the votes in these counties. And we're going to have, I'm going to call Bob this week on how to do the discovery because we've got a short period of time and we're going to get an enormous resistance. We're going to try to bring in more counties to include more than 50% of the state. And when we include more than 50% of the state, we'll have a fair description of the various uh, counties and maybe a chance to get a little a bit of an equalizer if we can find where these missing votes are. There's missing votes, there's provisional votes that were counted improperly that we know of, and there's the shredder problem, the whiteout problem, uh, there's a long litany. And and, and Bob Fertrakis, what, 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 you know, Bill's going to ask you advice. What would be the battle strategy? Is there hope to restrain this kind of out-of-control undermining of uh, the democratic process? Uh, yeah, there is. It, it, I mean, obviously, it's harder after the fact. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, uh, Bill's on top of the shredders. Uh, Michael Wu actually uh, uh, allowed what for massive shredding in 2004 in Cuyahoga County, uh, which was Cleveland. And also, uh, it now 41 percent of the provisionals, which was the highest uh, rate uh, in uh, the state. So he's got a long history of shredding ballots. Uh, uh, by the time we, you know, uh, were able uh, to fight in Ohio and get an order to actually count the ballots, you uh, know, Bill's way ahead there. Um, uh, he's right; they're supposed to be held for 22 months. But 56 of Ohio's 88 counties had accidentally or on purpose uh, destroyed uh, the ballots, including Montgomery County, uh, uh, which is Dayton, Ohio, which destroyed every single ballot, claiming they thought it was a state election uh, schedule and not a federal election. And so they destroyed them after six months, even though legally they were supposed to be held for 22 months. And the problem there is, you know, our argument is somebody needs to go to jail. These are election officials. Uh, how can they say they don't know the law? But uh, the problems we had in Ohio is the county prosecutor who was supposed to prosecute them was their attorney on behalf uh, of the state. And uh, we had a classic story in Holmes County where the Amish lived. There were 10,000 more votes than ever before, and they claimed the old order Amish What's voted the for the first time in history, leaped in their horse and buggies and raced to the polls. Uh, no one saw that happen. So when we asked for the 20,000 ballots to count, uh, sadly, all of them had been destroyed by a 12-cup uh, coffee machine that was in the voter vault. I don't know what it was doing in there. Since it was supposed to be under double lock and key from both parties. But the uh, craft of coffee Marin. broke Marin. and uh, destroyed non all 20,000 ballots. A non Listening to Flashpoints on Pacifica Radio, this is Flashpoints, your daily investigative news magazine. We're talking, as we have been uh, for weeks now, about the way in which uh, U.S. elections are uh, crooked, undermined, being fixed, rigged, played with, uh, stolen, elections stolen right out from under our eyes, all kinds of things going on in good old America where they say, you know, the vote is sacred and, and our elections are at the heart.
part of what a, a good democracy is. Let me bring into this conversation Lori Grace. Uh, she considers herself an election integrity activist. She works with the group the group Trust Vote. She's from Marin County, California. Welcome, uh, Lori Grace. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I've been working uh, with the issue of election integrity since '03, where I was working with Bev Harris and Black Box Voting and watched the stealing of the election with uh, Kerry and Bush and, and watched how Americans responded to it and watched how exit polls started being adjusted to fit uh, uh, electronic vote totals and worked with Bob Fitrakis. Uh, and Harvey Wasserman since uh, 2004. And, uh, and what's at the core of this for you? Well, the core of this particular election. Yeah, and, and, okay. and this work Happy that you do. That. And this work that you do. A profound desire to see a real democracy and uh, a, a deep sadness, a, a mourning about what really is the case and kind of a determination to try to create um, a, a democracy which is uh, elections run by the people for the people with transparency and integrity. By the people for the people with transparency and integrity. That sounds pretty good. Listen, talking about the people, let me give out a couple of phone numbers because we're, I'm open, uh, and our guests, I'm sure, will be open to, if you were a particular voter, you had a struggle, if you worked at a poll, uh, I'm looking for very succinct, pointed questions, uh, that you have directly for our guests. You can call us at 1-800-958-9008. 1-800-958-9008. Uh, and, uh, Please prepare your question, ask it, and uh, we will have our guests respond as best <laughs> as possible. This is obviously an incredibly important issue. Uh, the timeliness is, of it is obvious, and uh, we are delighted to have these free speech airwaves and the Flashpoints show over Pacifica to get into this in such depth. Again, 1-800-958-9008 or 510-848-4425. So, Bob, where does your suit go from here? Well, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, mailed out the service today uh, to the Edison Research uh, Group. Uh, you know, it's it's filed. The complaint is, uh, the complaint is specifically uh, against uh, Edison, the, the exit pollers, and uh, they'll have, uh, you know, the 60 days or so, uh, you know, to respond. Uh, again, uh, if if they uh, refuse to uh, waive service and and respond, uh, we'll have to serve them uh, uh, with the marshals, which I have no problem uh, uh, doing. Right. Uh, I guess that's what they're for. Uh, Stacy, join us on Flashpoints on Pacifica Radio. Do you have a question? I do. Hi, my name is Stacy. I'm here in San Francisco, and I was one of the people working get out the vote for Bernie and help start the Green Party in California. And my question, and I'm a friend of yours, Bill, thank you for your work, um, just how can Bernie advocates and Green Party leftists outside of the Democratic mainstream candidates really support the work that you're doing in terms of navigating this next phase between now and the convention? Uh, getting out the word of what is the strategy? A lot of people are looking for that question. How can we support your work, be strategic about what we say on social media, especially in the next couple of days? Hi, Stacy, and thanks. That's a great question. Uh, we need, uh, obviously, we need financial support, uh, and Lori Grace can talk about trust vote and uh, ways that, that could happen. Uh, in terms of strategy, I think the strategy is to not overstate our case, but rather focus on good questions uh, that can be asked of these registrars uh, in order to get the information we want from them as succinctly as possible. A lot of it really boils down to asking the right questions and not getting buried in the weeds. Uh, there are many votes out there, as we know, that could go towards Bernie even at this late date. Uh, everything from provisionals being counted correctly to the NPPs being counted correctly to good estimates to how many NPPs were lost. 
to good experts like Paul Mitchell in L.A. and other statisticians that we could uh, bring on board. We really need two or three excellent experts who hopefully won't cost us a million bucks and can get right to the point. Uh, Michael, join us on Flashpoints on Pacifica Radio. And uh, by the way, Bob or uh, uh, Lori, um, feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, listener, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, I was sort of stunned about this, this the, well, a lot of things, but like the, the whiteout. Um, I'm just curious about that specifically. Like what what actual rationale do they, I mean, they, they publicly say that someone voted for the wrong person. And how, how do, like, what's the, the supposed rationale or logic it, which they use to justify that? I mean, can we, is there some kind of argument or like legal Oh, well, Michael Vu, the man who's now in his fifth season of ir irregularities, told us in writing yesterday that he did it because uh, it, he cited various examples, such as well, the NPP ballot only had presidential candidates. The Democratic ballot had presidential candidates and the Democratic Central Committee, like in most counties. And... Uh, they often gave NPP voters a Dem ballot by mistake or because they ran out of the NPP Dem ballot. And the long and the short of it is they said, well, we had to white out the candidates, but we got lots of pictures of Bernie being whited out. We'll hear stories that that was Republicans. We'll hear stories that was American Independent. Our argument is going to be, doesn't matter what party it is, Bernie was on the ballot, his vote should be counted, same with Hillary, same with the other candidates. And, uh, and we had this problem in 2004, uh, the notion was that you could remake these because they were mangled and too hard uh, to read. And these were supposed to be very rare. Uh, but we did get uh, access to ballots in, in various counties. Uh, and in one county, we find uh, we found that 136 straight voters uh, had to be, they weren't whited out. They put little white dots uh, over the John Kerry column. And then they could run them through uh, a machine. Uh, so we found tremendous amounts of so-called remade votes. Uh, and in this case, uh, one person was allowed to remake all the votes uh, without uh, a person from another party there. So it's a longstanding tactic. Uh, tactic. Uh, and it's supposed to be a rare legal, you know, occurrence, but uh, we found they were quite common in Ohio in '04. Was this were these remakes? Were these remakes in Sonoma County or Ohio or where? Uh, in Ohio, uh, again, mainly in in the rural areas where uh, a man named Ron Bayman, uh, a statistician who teaches college in Illinois, uh, went in as one of our observers and. Uh, uh, to check it out, and uh, they said he could randomly sample ballots. Uh, he found 136 straight remakes. We, well, we found whiteout in almost every room, not just the remake room. And we don't think, of course, like you, that they shouldn't use whiteout on a ballot in any circumstance whatsoever. Just like there should never be a shredder truck ever parked anywhere near an ROV. <laughs> did, did we see any whiteout jars in the Brexit vote? <laughs> Not that in I know, but they finished in one day instead of a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, why don't you jump in here, Lori? Um, well, I'd, I'd like to mention uh, the in purpose and inspiration behind the uh, the lawsuit that I worked actually with Bob Vitrakis to submit, and uh, that is um, it's really to educate people in our country, and we fully expect uh, the empire to strike back, so to speak. We fully expect Edison me uh, Media Research to file a motion to dismiss and what we're really going to need at that time or if uh, we can start a RICO case and get to the paper ballots where we'll also expect the the empire to strike back we want really to know the American public to know that these large corporations basically the equivalent of 1% the 1% are determining our elections and determining our votes and and uh 
uh, that what we need to create, and I implore people out there right here, right now, to step forward. We need a, a large number of people to begin to demand a new election system, to begin to create them and invent them and bring in open source and other kinds of ways of sharing or hand-counted precinct-based counting, just different ideas. And I'm hoping at some point to create a conference later this year where we can look at new strategies and solutions. This is the third presidential candidate I've seen fold. When, you know, I saw Gore fold, I asked him why I was a climate project presenter. He didn't want to create a revolution, he said. I saw Kerry fold. I was part of Audit the Vote. Now I see Bernie Sanders vote in fold. And I just feel a lot of dismay. All right, you're listening to Flashpoints on Pacifica Radio. We're talking about the stealing of elections in the United States. Right, in the United States. Where's Jimmy Carter? I think he, need him? he has to put together some teams <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. travel abroad to the United States and find out what's going on here with these elections. Mm -hmm. The phone number is 1-800-958-9008. We also have uh, the very uh, important uh, vote fighter, uh, Bob Fertrakis. He's joining us from Columbus, Ohio. We've got our own Bill Simpich, who lives in the Mission District and is on the battlefront here in California. And we're going to stay on this. And I need to let people know, by the way, that for the... Um, the Republican and the Democratic Convention, flashpoints will be heard locally uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon instead of 5 o'clock. Uh, and those who listen in other cities, please bear that in mind. Uh, more to come about that. Uh, we have a listener, I believe, on from Sebastopol. Is that right? Are you there, listener? I am. Uh, who, who is this, please? Tell us your name. This is Brian. Brian, join us. Thank you, um, and thank all of uh, your guests for their great work. I, too, have been in utter dismay at uh, what has happened to our election system. Maybe it hasn't happened. Maybe it's always been this way. That's what I think. But, but uh, uh, very weary of l the notion of long, long-standing tactics, and, and uh, why do we have to have tax tactics? Shouldn't elections be fair and uniform? for every citizen of the United States. So the question, I guess, is um, why? what is the origin of all these registrars being local to states and not a federally uniform election uh, format? Let me take it for a minute for California, and I bet Bob has more. Uh, but in California, there's 58 counties. I call them 58 fiefdoms. The d dukes and duchesses get to uh, count the votes and set up the election pretty much the way they want. The secretary of state has a, the power to make these fair and uniform under statute, and he will not for political reasons, we can only assume. Uh, it, uh, it's an easy fix if they wanted to do it, but they don't want to do it. It works really well, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, to be able to shift the vote any way you want. If you call up like I've called up, they, they will they will give you a thousand votes just with a letter saying, oh, I'll count it this way instead. Thank you for your letter. That is not the way to conduct an election. Mm -hmm. Bob, did you want to respond? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really a great uh, quote. And for the recent statement from uh, Jimmy Carter's grandson, uh, you know, and as people, many of them, Bernie supporters, have, have written the Carter Center. Uh, the Carter Center is, uh, has been on the, the, uh, on the record. Uh, number one, uh, Jimmy Carter told uh, Der Spiegel that the United States uh, has a dysfunctional democracy. It's not a functioning democracy. Uh, his grandson said, we don't observe American elections because they don't meet minimum standards of democracy. That is, there's mm. no federal law in place and in reality you know you've got uh you know five to eight you've got five thousand county boards of election you've got at least another three thousand municipal uh, registrars so you've got 50 states and many of these states as it's been pointed out in in ohio uh 88 uh different uh, uh counties in the rural counties of ohio four of them don't purge any voters even when they're dead. 
and in some of the urban areas with large voting populations. Uh, Michael Liu, for example, purged a quarter of every single voter in Cleveland between 2000 and 2004. And the more the precinct was black, the higher percentage of the deregistration purges. 51% uh, of voters in black districts, certain black precincts, uh, were purged by Michael Vu. I mean, again, in, uh, in the European Union, it's a constitutional right to vote. We're one of the only democracies on earth where it's, uh, we don't have a protected constitutional right to vote, and we're at the whim of a Jim Crow system that says states' rights should prevail. My friend Debbie from El Sabrante, join us on Flashpoints. Welcome, Debbie. <laughs> hi, hi, Dennis. Thank you for the the guest that you have. And I just listening to the, the person who just spoke. I was just calling to say, in Argentina, the uh, voting is a civil um, duty, and I think this is what should happen here. I mean, I think after the age of sixty-five. Uh, over, you don't have to vote. But between the age of 18 and 65, you have to vote. And I think that would be a start. Um, other, you know, other um, uh, observers from another country would be probably the best thing because it's been proven that there is fraud here in the United States of America, which I am completely uh, uh, just shocked. You were a poll like, watcher, yeah. right? You were a poll well, watcher. Yeah. You were a poll watcher. Yes. We were watching, but we were observing the count, but the problem is that we weren't able to be right there with our heads over the shoulders. We had to be in a separate room. There's a, a big uh, um, window where you could look, mm -hmm. but that's not that's not right. It should be that the observers should be able to be right there observing the count. Uh, well, I, so. Yeah, I, well, I actually was an international uh, observer uh, in the first election in El Salvador following uh, the Civil War. Uh, and as an international election observer, uh, I co-wrote the report to the U.N. and I edited that report. The only thing the uh, guerrillas and the uh, you know, uh, the government of the Reina, right wing uh, uh, government, could agree on is a transparent box, and the ballots would be opened before all the observers, hmm. the media, both parties. Now, that hmm. doesn't happen uh, here uh, in the United States. Uh, it's essentially black box uh, of voting. When election observers came into Ohio in 2004, uh, which I was one of the people that had put out a letter of request and wanted to observe American elections. J. Kenneth Blackwell, the co-chair of the Bush-Cheney re-election campaign, and the man running the election in Ohio said that if any of these distinguished jurists and observers came within 100 feet of a polling place, he would have them arrested and cuffed by the county sheriff. So that's how we welcome international observers in the U.S. Wow. Hmm. Do you want to jump in here and talk a little bit about, more about the people's work in this context? Uh, well, I, I just... Um, I'm aware of how restricted observing is in, uh, in my county, which is why I decided not to do it anymore, because it was a waste of my time to look at somebody's back, lifting an arm up and sticking a ballot in a machine. You no, know, I... Uh, and I felt I could be more useful. But uh, what I would really like to find a legal way we, that we can make a change in this, and it's something, Bill, that I've been meaning to ask you about because I don't know how to do it, and I think we need to do it. Well, I'm tell you right now, once this count issue is done in the next month or two, it may go on for a while, but when the dust settles, let's put it that way, we're going to sue every county that has blocked these observers. These observers are some of the heroes of California, heroes and heroines. We owe everything to them just by keeping their feet to the fire and showing how repressive the election system is. You know, I can't tell you how many <clears throat> good people and good listeners and smart folks uh, 
got so angry. We, we've been doing this uh, weekly thing with Greg Pallast on Wednesday. Got so angry. A number of folks uh, could not believe that the kinds of outrages that you are describing now could possibly be going on. <clears throat> yes, there's a, a small votes, but you know these all these votes have a purpose. And generally speaking, you know uh, it, the the system is working. Virtually every county blocks observers from effectively watching the vote. Every county. Yeah, and, Virtually yeah, and, everyone. And, uh, yeah, we, we've taken many arrests, and uh, we've learned to be strategically arrested to have police reports in Ohio. Uh, what we found uh, in Ohio is they bring it, in many cases, they contract to private uh, technicians to come in when the vote doesn't match. Uh, and we actually looked up. There was one guy, uh, William Hogsett, who we used to call on his bill, who whenever the actual vote count was massively off from the reported vote count, they put this one guy in a booth alone <laughs> with a computer and, and wouldn't let anyone watch him. The vote, the uh, vote and executioner. Magically, <laughs> and magically, the vote would count. So we looked him up, and he had... In a newspaper, a letter where he lived saying his main goal in life was to shoot a liberal. So that oh my gosh. just prior to his death would know that the gun didn't kill him, but it was, you know, uh, Mr. Hogsett that had killed the liberal. And this is the guy who the Secretary of State is sending in as a private vendor from yes and yes. And in Ohio, the people who control the database in this state and the electronic poll books and do all the maintenance and did the maintenance for the recount in 2004 are the Rapp family. They're the leading right-to-life family <laughs> in Ohio. They live in a bunker-like compound, and they're doing most of the databases and the electronic poll books that keep uh, you know, throw off a hundred thousand newly, uh, you know, registered. <laughs> All right, journey. let me interrupt because we've got. I want to get one more caller in, Patrick. Uh, very briefly, what's your question? Um, join us. Hi, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, I wanted to mention I was an actual poll worker on election day, but one of the things that I think is part of the problem, and I wanted to ask you or guess this is that. You know, these registrars, they're county-based. I think their budgets are very small and their staffs are small. So, of course, they don't want to do a really good count. They want to get the results out there as quickly as possible, wrap it up, and then report the results to the public and the media as quickly as possible. So they just make up the results. Uh, I want to give uh, all of my uh, guests a very brief final comment. Bob. Where, yeah. what, to, what do we need to know here? Well, we need to know we're not a democracy because we allow a private, for-profit, uh, partisan companies to count our software with proprietary software, and they're in collusion uh, with these local registrars, and that this election... They targeted the Sanders people. They used mega and metadata and okay. went after these new voters. And it was an election. In California, it was a coup. All right. And let me, I want to come back to you uh, just for a moment. Um, uh, so, Lori Grace, tell if people want to know more about the work that you do, support the work that you do, learn the different ways that they can get involved in helping this kind of operation. What what do they do? So I would um, suggest that they go to trustvote.org. Let me repeat that one more time. Trustvote.org because we are fo doing follow-up on the lawsuits that, uh, that Bill has been talking about here in California. Also, we've co-sponsored the one with the uh, um, uh, with Bob Vitrakis and other things. Okay, and the website again? Trustvote.org. Okay, we're out of time. Bill? We need lawyers, computers, and money.